My name is Dr. Martin Schwartz. I'm Executive Director of the National Center for Stuttering in New York City. The National Center for Stuttering was established in 1976. Its goals since then have essentially remained unchanged and have been fivefold. First, to survey, research, and record clinical observations on stuttering. Second, to use this information to generate a continuously evolving model of stuttering. Third, to use this model to generate a model therapy. Fourth, to test this therapy with diverse populations of people who stutter. And then fifth, to take the results of such testing to create ever more powerful and effective treatments. Since 1976, over 800 speech pathologists have been trained and more than 14,000 people who stutter have been treated using these methods. We come now to what we call the understanding. This is the foundation for all of our work. This constitutes a new and alternative way of looking at stuttering. And I believe that you will find this way logical and that it leads directly to a very productive treatment. So, why not begin right now? At the bottom of this drawing we see two lungs. Out of each lung comes a pipe. The two pipes collectively are known as the bronchi. They join to form a single pipe, the windpipe or trachea. Sitting on top of the windpipe is your voice box, the technical name for which is the larynx, and you can see that the voice box is centered in the neck. Let's just look a little closer at the voice box. And when we do, we observe that the front cover is called the Adam's apple. Its technical name is the thyroid cartilage. And what we're going to do now is to remove the front cover of the voice box so we can look into the box. When we do that, we can make a couple of observations. First, there is a hole at the top and bottom of the box. Now, the reason there has to be a hole at the top and the bottom is that all of the air that comes from the lungs and passes out of your mouth or nose, must pass through the voice box. There are no side or collateral pathways. And if there wasn't a hole, the airflow would be blocked and you'd have a great deal of difficulty breathing. The second thing that we observe is that there are two shelves one on either side of the voice box. They run from the front of the box to the back of the box and they are attached to the side walls. These two shelves can move. They can be apart as they are shown here or they can be touching each other as shown here. The voice box is like a valve. When the two shelves are touching each other, the valve is closed, and here, when the two shelves are apart, the valve is open. 
These two shells have another name. They are called the vocal cords. We must point out that the vocal cords are really not cords at all. Most people think of vocal cords as two vertical strings somehow swinging in the breeze when they are, in fact, two horizontal shelves just behind the Adam's apple, and they open and close like the shutter of a camera or like a quick opening and closing valve. Now, when anyone in the world gets set to speak, here's what happens. The person exhales, and the air comes up to the trachea, enters through the hole at the bottom of the voice box. But since the vocal cords are touching each other, the valve is closed and no air can escape. And meanwhile, the person is continuing to exhale, and what happens very quickly is that an air pressure, a positive air pressure, is built up underneath these lightly touched vocal cords, and I'm indicating some plus signs to show a positive air pressure, and when that air pressure gets great enough, the vocal folds suddenly get blown apart and they start to vibrate back and forth to make sound. And these two-headed arrows on either a vocal cord indicate the opening closed vibrating pattern of the vocal cords and the sound that is produced. In an adult male, the vocal cords can vibrate back and forth on average perhaps 120 times each second. In an adult female with smaller vocal cords, perhaps 200 times each second, and in children, 3, 4, even 500 times each second. These are very high-speed moving structures. going to turn out that the source of all of your stuttering is an event that occurs at your vocal cords before you speak. That's the source of all of your stuttering. If you can prevent that event, which we haven't specified yet, from occurring, there will simply be no stuttering. Think of that event as the trigger for your stuttering. This leads to the core difference between this approach and all other approaches. We do not treat stuttering. Instead, we treat the trigger for stuttering. If you want your stuttering treated, simply go elsewhere. But if you want your trigger treated, Please continue on. I think a little bit of history is now in order here. In the 1950s and 1960s, there was a laboratory in Leipzig, Germany, which was then part of the communist East Germany, and that laboratory studied the muscle tension patterns of world-class athletes went under conditions of stress like the Olympics, and they made some observations. Here were some. They discovered that when people are under stress, most get tense. Some get more tense than others, and everyone has a spot on the body where they focus their tension when they're under stress. In other words, the tension doesn't rise equally. Later, they call these places where people focus tension target areas. And they discover that target areas are inborn and often inherited, and that the five most common target areas are the muscles of the shoulder girdle, the abdominal wall, the lower back, the face, and the hands. They also observe that 2.5% of the world's people have a target area at the vocal cords. It is the basic intention of the National Center for Stuttering that all people who stutter, come 
from this 2.5% subpopulation. The people who stutter tend to target tension at their vocal cords when under conditions of stress. Let's consider the role of stress in stuttering. There are two kinds of stress. The first is ordinary stress. The stresses that we all have, stress at home, stress at work, stress at school, financial pressures, etc., etc. And the second are the special stresses of people who stutter, and there are four of these. Feared sounds, feared words, feared speaking situations, and one stress that you might not ordinarily think of, and that's the speed of the first word of each sentence. Not the second, third, fourth, or fifth word, but the first word of each sentence. This block diagram shows sufficient stress producing locked vocal cords. This tendency to lock the vocal cords in the presence of appropriate stress is an inborn reflex. It's sort of like the knee jerk reflex. You know, you hit your kneecap and the foot flies up, but you must hit your kneecap with sufficient force for the foot to fly up. If you merely touch your kneecap, the foot will not fly up. Similarly, you must have enough stress to cause the vocal cords to lock. That's an inborn reflex. You didn't have to learn it. Now, a word about locking is in order. As we indicated earlier, the vocal cords can be apart or they can be touching each other. By locking, I mean the cords could be locked in an open position or in a closed position. Some sounds are called voiceless sounds and they require the cords to be open. And they can be locked open. Other sounds are called voiced sounds and the cords have to be closed and they can be locked in the closed position. The point is they simply can't move on to the next sound because the cords are locked. And so, the thing that separates people who stutter from those who don't is that people who stutter are born with a target area at the vocal cords. People who stutter are born with a tendency when they're under sufficient stress to, quote, get all choked up, close quote. And that is an inborn and inherited reflex. People think that stuttering is inherited. That's not correct. It is the target area which is inherited. Now let's move on to a three-step process. Stress not only produces locking of the vocal cords, but the locked vocal cords, in turn, trigger the stuttering. And this stuttering is a learned reflex, what the psychologists call a conditioned reflex, what we can call a habit. So that there are, in reality, two sets of reflexes, an inborn one, and a learned one. So the process is stress, which produces a locking of the cords, which in turn triggers the stuttering. Now, most people think that stress causes stuttering. They can't see the locking of the vocal cords. It's buried in the neck. 
and people who stutter say that when they are under a lot of stress, they stutter a lot. And if they go into an empty room all alone and speak out loud, they have no stress and they can talk fine all day long. So isn't it obvious that stress causes stuttering? That's the common belief. And because of that, historically, two groups have worked on the problem. Psychologists, psychiatrists have worked on the stress. And speech pathologists have worked on the stuttering. And both in their own publications, their own journals, have reported terrible results. And the reason the results were so poor is that both groups were completely unaware of the middle step, the locking of the vocal cords, and so it was free to occur, and whenever it did occur, it would defeat the therapy, whatever the therapy was. If we can prevent the vocal cords from locking, we can prevent stuttering from being triggered. I'll say that again. If we can prevent the vocal cords from locking, we can prevent stuttering from being triggered. The great buildup of tension leading to the locking of the vocal cords occurs in the half second before speech begins. It is occurring in the silence before speech begins. And it's in the silence that we are going to have to intervene. Earlier we learned that stuttering is a learned reflex or a habit. question is, why would anyone want to learn something as unpleasant as stuttering? Well, let's ask a more general question. Why do people learn anything? There are a, a group of psychologists called learning psychologists who provide us with an answer. They say people learn because they get a reward. Let me give you some examples. What's the reward for learning to ride a bicycle? I can think of quite a few. Fun. Peer acceptance. Mastering a new skill. Not limited by the block anymore. There are many. Or another example. What's the reward for getting a good job? Fun. Money. A sense of purpose. Pride of accomplishment. There are many rewards. What's the reward for stuttering? Winston Churchill was a famous person who stuttered. You might say there is no reward for stuttering, but the answer is that there is. You've just simply not thought of it as yet. Well, Here's my office. Notice how neat and tidy it is. Here's a door to my lab, the doorknob. And if you uh, go up to this doorknob and you turn it and pull the door open, you see this terrific mess. And let's imagine I go between my office and my lab 50 times a day, and I've been doing this for the last three years. And whenever I try to do this, whenever I turn the doorknob and open it, I can always open it. It always works. It's sort of like a child uh, speaking for the last uh, three years speaking 50 times a day, and whenever the child tried to speak, the child always could speak. 
But to get back to the lab, upstairs there was a water pipe that sprung a leak and the water has oozed down and into the wooden door and has now caused the wooden door to swell and to be stuck in the door frame. But I don't know this. It was a very subtle, slow leak. So I go to the door the way I have been uh, 50 times a day for the last three years. I put my hand on the doorknob, I turn and pull, and nothing happens. What do I do? What would you do? What would most people do? You begin to struggle a bit to release that stuck condition, and finally you yank the door open. Okay. The technical name for that struggle, let's call stuttering. Because you see, stuttering doesn't start with the first words. The child has usually been talking for a year or two or three, and then one day the door gets stuck. That is, the vocal cords lock, the child suddenly can't speak, he or she begins to struggle to release the lock, the struggle is called stuttering. Getting the door open is the reward for the struggle that enabled me to get the door open. So let's imagine after I finally got the door open, five minutes later I went back to the door and it was stuck again. What would I do? Well, I would struggle because I learned the first time that if you struggle you can get the door open. I learned because I got the door open. Getting the word out is like getting the door open. Getting the word out is the reward for the struggle that enabled you to get the word out. Getting the word out is the reward for stuttering. Here's a definition. Stuttering is learned extricatory struggle behavior designed to release an inborn, frequently inherited tendency to lock the vocal cords when under conditions of stress. So you see, stuttering is learned. It's designed to release the lock and this only occurs under conditions of sufficient stress. Would you like to know another reward? Anxiety reduction. Anything that makes you less nervous is a reward. So you could be speaking and seeing a feared word coming. Your anxiety is rising. And just before you say that word, you substitute another word an easy to say word and your anxiety drops and so you rewarded your habit of changing words. Before we go further, let me pause for a moment to tell you about my make-believe hobby. Here I am, sitting in my most comfortable chair, listening to my most favorite music. I'm very relaxed. Here's my make-believe hobby. I like to take little pieces of metal called electrodes, and I paste an electrode on every muscle of my body, and from each electrode comes a wire, and the wires all gather together into a bundle of wires that goes into a machine which is going to register the average tension on all the muscles of my body. And the tension is only registering six out of a hundred because I am extremely relaxed. All of a sudden the door opens and in walks the cutest little two-year-old girl you ever saw in your life. And I look at her and the needle goes to 11, because it turns out that whenever 
there's someone around, there's always an increase in your muscle tensions, but not much in the case of this little buttercup. She's no threat to my physical well-being. At any rate, she ambles out the door, and the needle slowly drifts back down to six again. Minutes pass, and suddenly the door swings open wildly, and in comes Monster Man. What you can't see is that in his right hand he has a dagger which is dripping blood, and the smoke is curling out of the muzzle of the forty-five in his left hand, and at the top of his lungs he's screaming at me, I'm going to kill the next person I see. And where do you think the needle goes? 146. That's right. But what if I had just come from the planet Mars? You know, I just got off the rocket ship. They greeted me. They brought me to this room. They sat me down in the chair. They hooked up the electrodes to my Martian body, and here I am. And they had Monster Man with a knife and gun come out and menace me. What would I, as a Martian, think? I might think, ah, Earthman's friendly greeting. I mean, after all, what do I know? I don't know that that's a knife and that's blood. I don't know what the words mean. I'm going to kill the next person I see. What do I know? Earthman's friendly greeting. That means that our fears are learned. We're not born fearing a bloody knife. We have to learn that it's a threat. We're not born fearing a smoking forty-five. We have to learn that. We're not born fearing B sounds or D sounds. We have to learn that. We're not born fearing saying our name or where we work or what school we go to. We have to learn that. We're not born fearing talking on the telephone or public speaking or ordering in a restaurant. We have to learn that. Stuttering and the fears of stuttering are both learned. One hundred percent. And if they're learned, they can be unlearned. Let's pause and talk about the onset of stuttering. Most stuttering begins between the ages of two and seven. And there are usually some precipitating factors. Perhaps there was a new baby just born. You're no longer the center of attention. Or maybe you were bitten by a dog. Or maybe you're learning to speak your own language at the rates with which you hear your parents speaking that language. Or maybe your parents are getting a divorce. Or you moved to a new town. Or you started a new school and have a mean teacher. Perhaps you have four brothers and have to rush to get a word in edgewise. Or maybe you are learning ever more complex linguistic structures as you mature. Not too important what the stress or stresses were, but what was important was that on a particular day, there was enough stress present, focusing enough tension at your cords that the following thing happened. You brought your cords together to speak. But because you're among that 2.5% of the world's population that tends to target stress-induced tension at your vocal cords, the two vocal cords, instead of very gently coming together, now press together. They lock. But you don't know this because we're not good judges of how tight our cords are together. So what do you do? You build up the normal amount of air pressure to speak. But this normal amount of air pressure suddenly, for the first time, becomes incapable of overcoming the tight squeezing on the cords, and you got stuck. And when you got stuck, you suddenly found yourself unable to speak. And you begin to struggle against that stuck condition. And that struggle quickly becomes a habit for the reasons that we've described. And it's what the world sees and hears and calls stuttering. Now we come to a series of graphs. At the bottom, we have seconds from zero to four. At the left, we have vocal cord tension, which can range from low 
to high. Here we see a horizontal red line. This is Mr. X's threshold at which he locks his vocal cords. Mr. X decides he's going to start speaking at time zero, and he's going to speak for four seconds. During these four seconds, his vocal cord tension can range from low to high. If during these four seconds that Mr. X is speaking, his vocal cord tension goes above that red line, his cords will lock and he will stutter. So above the red line is the stuttering area, and below the red line is the fluency area. And it is very important, is it not, that during these four seconds that Mr. X is speaking, that he always keep his vocal cord tension below that red line. Mr. X is this young man, whose name is John Smith. And John happens to be at a party, minding his own business, when an attractive young woman comes up to him and says, Hi, my name is Mary Jane, what's yours? And John, in response to that, goes, John Smith. And the young woman's reaction is, Oh my God. Now, when John stuttered on his name, he was reacting to the question, What's your name? And that question, what's your name, was for John Smith pretty much like this guy. Troubles ahead. And where does John brace when he sees the trouble coming? He braces at his vocal cords and he stutters. Let's look at this diagram. If you look over at the very lower left, you'll see minus one, because it was at minus one that Mary Jane asked the question or said, Hi, my name is Mary Jane. What's yours? And then in a half second, at minus point five, John's vocal cord tension had risen so much, he was already above his threshold in the silence before he spoke. His pre-speech vocal cord tension was already above his threshold. Thus, is it any wonder that ch -ch 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 John Smith came out stuttered? So you see, the problem is not with the stuttering on John Smith. The problem is in the silence before he spoke. The silence before time zero. John Smith is a very clever fellow, and he says to himself, the next time a young woman asks my name, I'm not going to say John Smith. I'm going to say, my name is John Smith, because you see, I'm not afraid of the words my name is. It's like that two-year-old girl. And maybe I can use the saying of my name is as a kind of starter to get me into John Smith. So another young woman comes by, asks his name, and notice that his pre-speech tension is lower. It's below his threshold because he knows he's going to be saying my name is, and he's not very afraid not all the way down because he still knows he has to say the dreaded John. At any rate, out comes the my, out comes the name, out comes the is, and there's a tendency for the tension to rise with each word in a sentence, 
And there's that feared John, and he crosses his threshold, and he stuttered. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. He has good days. He had bad days. We'll explain those in a minute. Now, what if we could give John Smith something he could do before time zero that would drop the tension way down? At any rate, out comes the my, out comes the name, out comes the is, and there's the John, and he doesn't stutter because you have to cross your threshold. And John says, gee, what went right there? How come I didn't stutter on John? And the answer is nothing went right on John. It all went right before time zero. He just subtracted so much tension from his vocal cords before the start of speech that as he spoke and added tension to such a low level to begin with, he simply did not reach his threshold and thus he did not stutter. Well, how far down can I subtract tension with this first set of techniques I'm going to be teaching you? I can subtract it down to the second and lower horizontal red line, which is called your base level tension. The base level tension is the tension on your vocal cords when you are not speaking and when you are not planning on speaking. There are many variables that affect it. Stress at work, stress at home, stress at school, allergic reactions, how well you feel, financial pressures, subconscious events, how well you've been eating, how well you've been sleeping, brain and body hormone fluctuations, the degree of authority of the person to whom you are speaking, etc., etc. To speak requires tension as well. We call it speech tension. Now, the base level tension plus the speech tension equals the total tension on the vocal cords. And it's the total tension that we are dealing with. If the base level tension is high and we add to it speech tension, then the resulting total tension will cross the threshold much more and those will be your bad speaking days. On the other hand, if the base level tension is low and we add to it speech tension, then the resulting total tension will cross the threshold much less, and those will be your good speaking days. So, your good day, bad day variability has to do with shifting base level tension. The base level tension contributes approximately 70% to the total tension on the cords. The speech tension contributes only approximately 30% to the total tension on the vocal cords. You must therefore realize how important the base level tension is. When you go into an empty room alone, your base level tension drops dramatically and you can speak out loud with total fluency. You need no techniques when you speak out loud in a room alone. Your base level tension has dropped. Now, continuing with this, there are some people who come in with moderately elevated base level tensions, It's not way down. The arena within which we have to work is the space between those two horizontal red lines. So if they are close to one another, the person can use the technique, say, my name is, and then maybe on John he's going to hit his threshold, so he reapplies the technique, does what we call a mid-sentence reapplication, 
and then says his name. Later on, when we learn techniques for lowering the bass level tension, the need for mid-sentence reapplications will disappear, but at the beginning, we'll all be practicing them. And then, there are people with highly elevated bass level tension. The space between the two horizontal red lines is really small, and for those people we use low energy speech. And low energy speech is defined as a very soft voice with reduced effort. And it causes the tension on each word to rise much more gradually so you can get more words out before the need to use a mid-sentence reapplication. And we'll all be practicing low energy speech as well. So now, for lowering the speech tension, we have a technique I call intent therapy. It was formerly called airflow, but that really wasn't correct. And the second technique we have is low energy speech. For lowering the base level tension, we have nutritional supplements, which will be talking about, and stress reduction techniques. Our goal in this program is to attack the total tension on the vocal cords from all of the potential contributing sources so we can keep the total tension well below the locking threshold so we can have a reliable fluency. One important diagram should be put forth at this time to prepare you for the treatment section. Let's look at it in some detail. On the right, we see the brain. Uh, below it, locked vocal cords. Two thick yellow lines going up to the brain with red arrows on them. And in the vocal cords, two red dots. And they are described as nerve endings which originate sensory impulses. Those are the red arrows that travel up the nerve fibers, the yellow, to the brain. And then above that, it says, a unique pattern of sensory impulses goes to the brain when the vocal cords lock. This pattern is the trigger for stuttering. So if we want to stop the stuttering, we have to prevent that pattern of nerve impulses from reaching the brain. And that's what we're going to be doing and so, on now to treatment.